welcome to this video where I will be sewing and talking a bit about medieval hoods. I think medieval hoods or layer pipes or whatever you want to call them are a very interesting medieval garment. Because if you would ask a random person on the street, what are you thinking about when I say medieval clothing? Because I think that a very big part of them would mention hoods. Because it's a very iconic part of the medieval wardrobe because we don't really see them before or after the middle ages as a difference to tunics and dresses and stockings and different types of veils but the thing is is this true <laughs> so today i thought that we could talk a little bit about the hood its history where it comes from how long it has been around and also how you can create your own But I think we need to start from the beginning. What is even a hood? Because that can be quite problematic when looking at sources because the lines between a hood and a cloak and a gardecorp, 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 and a chaperone could be very confusing. But according to Cambridge Dictionary, it's a part or a piece of clothing that can be pulled up over the top and back of the head. And according to Wikipedia, it's a kind of headgear that covers most of the head and neck and sometimes the face and leave the face mostly or partly opened and may be worn for protection from the environment or for fashion. And I think that's quite important when talking about the difference between hoods and sometimes veils and coifs and caps because my personal perception is that hoods are a very fashionable item sometimes but it's also a um, practical item and quite often made out of wool or a thicker material. Okay, but when do we see the start of using hoods? That is very hard to know. When hoods are worn for fashionable reasons, it's very much easier to know because you see them in more depictions and, you know, worn in higher classes in society and therefore more often preserved. There are some evidence of the Romans that they wore hoods and there are some early archaeological evidence of them. And now I remember that I also want to mention another thing and that is that this is very much focused on Europe and European Middle Ages, so you know that. But as I said, there are some vague evidence, depending on what you see as a hood, that can be found in the early European Middle Ages. But then we come to a very much discussed time period, namely the Viking Age, or the late Iron Age, or the early Middle Ages, depending on what you want to call it. Were the Vikings wearing hoods? It's hard to know. There are some finds in Hedeby, uh, which is now Germany, which is often used by Viking uh, reenactors when recreating garments. And there's one fragment that has been interpreted as a hood or a layer pipe. The garment itself is really just three fragments of wool, and one of them is bigger and is thought to be the body of the hood. One of them has been interpreted as a gore and one of them as a layer pipe. The layer pipe in this time period has been a bit strange because we don't really see layer pipes this early. But the thing is, during the last years, this has instead been interpreted as a child's tunic or as a hose. But as I said, it's just a couple of fragments, so it's very hard to know exactly what it really is. Even if I personally agree to that it's quite strange that we would see a hood in this shape and size during this period. In the context of other early hoods, there's also another one that is often mentioned, namely the... Now I should say this right. Sköldehams... Sköld... Sköldehams... Sköldehams hood. Sköldehams... Sköldehams hood. It was found as a part of a whole costume in a bog near Sköldham in Norway. During the latest examinations of it, it has been dated to 1050 to 1090 AD. And that is placing it to the late Viking or early Middle Ages, whatever you want to call it. And this is also used very much when recreating clothing from this time, but it has been a very wide discussion about the context of this hood. If it belonged to a woman or a man, what the ethnicity was, and it has been a wide discussion if he or she was a Sami or not, and if the hood can in that case be applied to the rest of the fashion in Europe. And I should also mention that we have some finds in York and Dublin that sometimes are also mentioned as hoods, but 
when looking at them they are really really similar to caps or coifs so i don't really know if i should include them or not but the finds are very interesting so why not but when we come into the 12th century we know that hoods were worn in europe and now when we also see the rise of manuscripts we see them in there and when i have been looking i have almost only found them on men and also on men doing outside physical activities or work. And these hoods are small, they are very simple in construction, and they are also quite tight, and they have no tail or derby. And the same goes mostly for the 13th century. We see them sometimes being attached to cloaks or guardicorps. Guardicorps? I should really look these words up. And this is just my interpretation, but it seems like these hoods are mostly made of wool because we see them in this context and they also have different types of uh, colors that is very common on wool. And sometimes they have uh, different types of linings in different colors and sometimes embellished. But when we come into the 14th century, things are happening to the hoods. Yes, because hoods are becoming fashionable and now they are everywhere and especially among men you know noble men are wearing them all the time it's it's the garment of the 14th century they are decorated they have different colors they are bee colored and they are dagged sometimes they are edged with something that could be embroidery or beadwork they have lining no lining fur lining the men are just jumping around in these hoods they are really enjoying them very much very much and you know when something is fashionable and everyone is wearing it you tr try different styles and somewhere around the 14th century someone took their hood and tucked the face opening onto their head and just twisted it around and that became the chaperone which became very fashionable in the 14th and 15th century and the 15th sometimes in the 16th century we see the fall of the hood for the men but what about the women well, it's difficult to really know when women began to wear hoods because if we're talking about a practical garment, maybe it was worn long before we have any sources on it. And some people are saying that we see the beginning of women wearing hoods in the 13th century, but I would say somewhere around the beginning of the 14th. And for some reason, very much in France and England, and especially in, for example, the Luttrell Psalter, they have really you know, jumped onto that idea with hoods. And the first hoods that appear are almost just rectangles, just thrown upon the head. So it's a very loose and simple construction of maybe wool. And then this slowly develops into something sometimes called a uh, open hood or a French hood, or as we in Sweden call it, a uh, fruhetta, which in English is wife hood um, or woman's hood. It seems to have been a very similar construction to the early men's hoods, but with the difference of being open in the front. And that is thought to be of practical reasons, because it's so much easier to put it on when you have, you know, a fancy hairstyle and veils and wimples to just put it on like this instead of this. If you don't want to ruin everything, I have tried and I must uh, agree. And slowly this type of hood is spreading but as i mentioned before especially france and england for some reason in those countries it really develops to a quite small and tight hood with almost nothing on the shoulders and with quite distinct ears i would almost call them and of course the long ear pipe it really becomes this super popular garment especially in france and it has been thought that these hoods later in the last decades of the 15th century develops into the iconic renaissance and tudor headwear but this isn't the only style of hoods for women. There are some depictions and some finds of hoods that had buttons also in the front. So they could open them just as the open hood, but also close them. And it has been some hoods, I think two, uh, found in London that has been a 14th century deposit, which has been interpreted as women's hoods, quite small, and they have buttons in the front. And then we also have plenty of hoods from Greenland. During the Middle Ages, there were a medieval Norse settlement there. And thanks to the climate, the clothing in the graves has been preserved. So there we have a couple of hoods in different sizes and different shapes, but some of them are these small, tight, Hoods. And if these were women's hoods or men's hoods or child's hoods, 
it's hard to know really but the difference here is that all the hoods i think those i have looked into anyway had been closed in the front and the cut is very similar to the london hoods and the early medieval hoods um, but again it's hard to know if this quite isolated settlement if the fashion there can be applied to the rest of europe in scandinavia in southern europe in eastern and western or if these hoods are a very greenlandic thing but the interesting part in this is that these hoods actually has lyra pipes and lyra pipes is a quite fashionable thing during the time where they have been dated to so maybe but just as the hoods for the men um, and a little bit depending on where you are in europe the hoods for the women disappears somewhere in the 15th century. So one of the first things I wanted to make when I started to make medieval clothing was a medieval hood. And I took very much inspiration from the French manuscripts. And you know, the French hoods were so beautiful, so I took very much inspiration from them. But when I zoomed in more on Scandinavia and Germany, the question about hoods and the use of hoods is a little bit more complex. Because what I think is very important when reenacting something is very much deciding on what place, what geographical place you want to reenact. Because yes, you can mishmash as much as you want, but if you want to strive for some accuracy, you will soon find that there are differences in Sweden and France and in Russia and in Ireland. There are differences. So when looking at the Scandinavian sources that we do have, the German sources, hoods aren't really common. And that was a bit shocking for me because I've, I've seen all of these pictures, but the thing is a very big majority of them are French and English. I think I've only found, you know, one German picture of an open hood. One. And one Scandinavian. When we look into written sources, yes, there are some evidence of hoods. And now I'm talking about women's hoods. Because man's hoods, you know, we have the Buxton man, we have everything. So that's, that's clear. There are man's hoods in Scandinavia and Germany and the whole Europe. But women's hoods, it's not as clear but the important thing to remember here is also the context of the depictions that we do have in sweden we have very much church paintings which is you know religious scenes and often people being outside and in the summer and i didn't realize this because if you are in scandinavia and it's winter you will probably find the need sooner or later to a hood or a garment similar to a hood but the thing is we don't see that being depicted so we don't know so for me as a female scandinavian reenactor i have found the use of hoods uncertain because if we compare the use of hoods to veils for example which is another woman's headwear the difference is huge so this summer when i had some plant dyed scraps and I had much time. I wanted to make a hood, but I didn't know if I could do that or not. But my personal view on this is very much that maybe hoods in Scandinavia for women weren't fashionable in the same way as for the French and English women, but that doesn't mean they weren't worn for practical reasons. Just as the Greenlandic hood seems to have been, especially in cold weather and you know, there are some evidence of them in written sources, so why not? So my plan when I started this was to make a hood out of wool with inspiration from the Hagelsnes finds, the Greenland finds, and the London finds and make some kind of blend between them. That seems likely. And in a color and fabric that seems likely. Because sometimes you'll just need to go with things that seems likely. And that is what I will do in this video. A hood that could be worn in almost the whole Europe and in Scandinavia. So let's make this hood.
Okay, so I pinned her together and this is how it looks. But okay, if I put away my modern aesthetic, I think it actually doesn't look that bad. I think it looks quite cute, to be honest. Okay, so I pinned it together here in the front, um, quite tightly, because when people are recreating hoods, they tend to make them way too big. That's what we do today because we think that looks better. But they actually was more often than not tight. So I made mine very tight and I'm actually almost choked. So maybe it's a bit too tight. The good thing about mock-ups is that you can see what you need to, to change. And I see that I have way too much fabric here in the front, but the gussets or gores looks fine. I could put them a bit higher up maybe. And uh, I think this seam in the back looks acceptable as well. And obviously we're going to add a layer pipe here later. And then we have this. And I don't need all of that fabric. No. <laughs> so I'm going to take away that as well. And now this measurement is according to an original. But the thing is that I really want this hood to be a practical winter garment. And I really want it to cover my neckline completely. So I think one of the changes I will do as well is making it bigger here at the shoulder part. So I will try to keep all of this in mind. But I would also recommend you, if you also see things in your first mock-up that you want to change, to do another mock-up and maybe another mock-up. But the thing is, um, I'm lazy. So I will actually just try to remember all of this and bring my real fabric. Which is so exciting! <laughs> because I'm going to use a fabric that is just like a baby to me. <laughs> because I love this fabric so much. This is a fabric made from wool. It's quite thick and quite sturdy because you really want that in hoods to keep you warm and dry. And if I'm not wrong, it's twill. Yeah, it's twill. And I have planted it myself. It was originally naturally white and then I put it in the third bath of matter. And I think the color turned out absolutely beautiful. Maybe it's a little bit too warm for my skin tone. But since we're doing medieval clothing, that doesn't really matter. But since we're doing medieval clothing, that's fine. And if you get inspired to make a hood yourself, I would really suggest to find a thick and sturdy wool because that seems to have been the most likely choice in the Middle Ages if you want to strive for historical accuracy. You don't have to. So now I'm going to lay this out and start cutting up my hood. that we could do now is to begin to sew. When I am making historical clothing I most often use linen thread but the Greenland finds are actually sewn with wool thread. I don't know how the London hoods are sewn because I can't find any information about them. So I will go with wool thread. I'm not using it that often but when I do I often buy it from historical textiles or buying it from a secondhand store which is a tip that I have for any type of textile related thing. Look at secondhand stores.
after a lot of sewing, we have sewn together the um, base of the hood, if one can say so. So all the way around here and here. And then we have the two gores. And I actually think they turn out very well, even if they became way more pieced than I thought they would. Um, for some reason, but that's how it is. And now we're going to sew these into the hood. And sewing gores into a garment can actually be a little bit trickier than one thinks, because you really need to have the placement and the width and the uh, point of the gore into the right position, and that can sometimes be a bit problematic. And I also was a bit unsure about the technique that I was going to use, because you can sew gores from the inside, as a usual seam, but you could also sew them from the outside. And when I looked into the Greenland hoods, I saw that those were sewn from the outside. And I've done that a couple of times before, but I wanted to do it again because it's quite fun actually. But it can be a little bit tricky before you get the hang of it. So how we'll sew these cores is that we will lay our hood onto the floor and then we'll just cut the slit and take the gore and place it underneath that slit. And then we're going to see that we have the right position of the gore and fold the edges down on the hood and pin them in place. Was that even understandable? I don't know. <laughs> so after you've pinned the whole gore in place, we're going to take the same thread and needle as before and sew small, small whip stitches so that they are almost invisible when looking at the garment from the outside, even if the seam is on the outside. This is so cool, I love this seam. And then we're going to sew that seam all the way around both cores. Okay, I thought that we could start making the buttons now. There is buttons before the 14th century, but it's really there where we see it being fashionable. So I thought that it would be very fun to do some here in this hood. And now I'm talking about fabric buttons because we see buttons in other materials as well. But today I thought that I could show you how I do my fabric buttons. The way I've learned it, I don't know if this is the correct way of doing it, but this is the way that works well for me. So we'll start by taking one, and this is very good because you will not throw away anything from this process because these scraps is something that we're going to use now. So we're going to take one of these and we're going to cut out a little circle and you can decide here how big you want the circle to be. This is maybe, now I never use coins anymore, but like a little coin or a circle maybe 1.5 centimeters in diameter and then we're going to take some linen thread and i would actually very much recommend linen thread because you want something that is very strong because we're going to do a lot of pulling here and then we're going to take the circle and sew a couple of running stitches some millimeters from the edge When we have sewn all the way around, we're going to pull this thread. The step now, I have noticed, is a bit tricky, especially with this fabric and with this size of button. Because now we're going to tuck all the sides into the middle and try to keep them staying there. And if you have a thinner fabric or a bigger button, you will probably do this a lot easier. Because you want to keep it all there. And sometimes it can be a bit hard. Sometimes I use uh, maybe a hairpin or another tool to tuck all of this in like so. You can't really see, but now we're tucked all the ends into this. And now we're going to sew a smaller row of back stitches on the edge once again. 
you don't have to be super precise here. The whole way around. And then we're going to pull this once again. And you can do a third row again if you want to. I think I actually will do that. Just a few stitches just to really keep this in place. And now you will hopefully have something that is starting to take a round little ball shape. But mine is still a bit flat, it's still a bit uneven, and it's still quite loose. So now we'll start sewing some stitches across the bottom of this. And pull those stitches as tight as you possibly can without your fingers or thread breaking. Like so. Now we have a little button here. It's not perfect, but it's quite cute. And now we'll take a couple of centimeters from that thread and cutting it off. And this thread we can later use to sew it on the hood. And then it's just to continue. I think I will need around 20 to 30 of them in this hood. That is a lot of work. <laughs> so I think it's just to continue. It took quite a while for me to finish all the buttons, but now they all are in place on the hood. And uh, if one is allowed to say that, I am actually very happy with them. I think they're very... they look very neat. I think they're really a nice detail on this. But we can't have buttons without buttonholes, so now we need to start with those. And I was looking quite much into um, pictures and clothing you i'm sure you recognize this book and they have a couple of pictures of extant uh, buttonholes and now we'll show you directly from the book here is one example and as you can see we have uh, some lining here on the inside we have the buttonholes themselves and then it's fastened on the inside with i mean it could be running stitches but it could also be whip stitches or maybe both. And then we come to the scary stuff. It has tablet woven braids on the edges. And here we also have a drawing where they show how it could have been done. And the thing is, I've never done tablet weaving on the edges of a garment before. So this is very interesting. I looked into Morgan Donner's video here on YouTube and tried to understand this. I also looked into many books and many other tutorials how to do this, so that is going to be very um, uh, frightening, fun, but frightening. But we're not really there yet, because first we're going to make the facing on this. So I'm going to cut out some strips of linen, sew them in place and make the buttonholes.
and when I've assembled the face into the hood, I'm just going to start making the buttonholes. And there's so much tutorials on how to do buttonholes on YouTube, for example. So if you're uncertain on how to make them, you can just do a quick search. But I will just measure where I want my buttonhole to be, cut up a tiny slit and then sew the whole way around with buttonhole stitches. And the buttonhole stitches should be placed with a little, little gap in between. And then you're just going to continue sewing all the buttonholes, which will take a while. I've done this for like too many days now. But that's just because I'm so slow and so bad at doing buttonholes, but that's all right. And then you're just going to continue sewing all the buttonholes and it will probably take a while. So you know what? The buttonholes are finally done and we can go on to the next step in this never-ending hood creating process, which is the tablet weaving. And why we should do tablet weaving is just because I'm seeing so many finds on it, where you have a tablet woven braid going at the edge on the side where the buttonholes are. Most often I've seen it in silk, so I don't really know if wool, which I'm going to use now, is the most correct thing. But to me it seems quite logical. I mean, why not? So I will use this wool sewing thread, which is quite thin, and use it as my thread for tablet weaving. Okay, so I can see if I can uh, take one of these pictures and show you better, but yeah. So here they have the tablets, and they seem to be 50 millimeters big. Okay, five centimeters. Since I don't have any tablets on my own, I will create my own. So, and that's just something I will do out of cardboard, which should work fine. So I really hope it does. So we're just going to cut out five centimeter squares. Okay, that is ish, five centimeter. I don't think it matters too much. Okay, two small squares. And now we're going to do this specific weave. It's enough with just one, one hole there and one hole there. So you can take something to make a hole with, like one of these, for example, and then we're just going to make a hole in the corner. Like so, and then the same on the other one. And then we have two of them. And then it's time to take our thread. You will probably need this thread to be at the least equal as long as the edge itself. You see, I have no idea about this. Okay, I do them quite long, just in case. And then we're going to make four of them and then cut. Okay, I don't really know, but I think I will make a knot here in the end. And then I'm going to take my small tablets and bring the thread through the holes. So we have one tablet here and then one of the threads should go through this hole, another should go through this hole and then the same on the other one. Okay, like so. Now we have the tablets on the thread and then we're going to have another thread with a needle on. Like so. And then apparently we're just going to start weaving. <laughs> yes! Apparently we're going to weave away from ourselves, which means that you can make a knot here as well. On the other end. And tie yourself onto something else. In your kitchen or wherever you are. Okay. And now we're going to take another thread and tie it around ourselves. You can just take a belt too, that works equal as fine, and tie that onto this. So it seems like the basic way we're going to do this is whip stitches almost with this thread into the hood, but each time we're going to go through these, and each time we have sewn one stitch into the hood with this thread, we're going to turn the tablets 180 degrees. That's how I've understood it. I don't really know every weaving word in English, not in Swedish either, 
but you see this space here that is our space and when you turn these the threads are going to change place After all the weaving is done, we don't really have that much left to do, but we have one important part left, and that is the layer pipe itself. There's no real reason to why I've waited so long, you don't, you shouldn't really do that maybe, but I just wanted to make sure that I wouldn't take too much fabric for it. I wanted to see how much fabric I would have left for the layer pipe, and the answer is this much. And to make a layer pipe is really really simple. I'm just going to cut out a clean rectangle and then fold it over and then fold the seam allowances in. And then I'm just going to sew it together with the exact same technique as I used for the other parts of the hood. So whip stitches with that pink wool thread from the outside. And then I'm just going to attach it to the hood itself. And how I will do that is just to rip this up and put the layer pipe in and sew it in place with the same whip stitches. And then you know, the layer pipe is done. It's not harder than that. And now it maybe it's time to do one of the things that it maybe is a bit more boring when it comes to creating his circle of clothing, which is filling the seams. You absolutely don't have to fill the seams, but if you have a fabric that is fraying and you want to prevent that, filling the seams can be a very good solution to that. And the Norse settlers on Greenland had this problem too. And it seems like their solution is take their seam allowances in gores at least and turn it to one side and securing it with whip stitches and those seam allowances seems to be around seven millimeters wide they never seem to be wider at least whereas on the shoulders for example those seam allowances are turned in different directions so it seems like it depends on where the seam allowance is and also if you have a gore <laughs> we can we can take this very ugly unfinished gore it seems like they're turned away from the gore itself so here in this direction and here in this direction so i think i will do that i don't really know about these seams and then i will take the seam running here in the back and turn it in different directions as i said before Now we only have the hemming left, or more precisely the bottom edge and the face opening, and we're going to do it in different ways. So on this bottom edge I thought that we could just fold it up and sew it down with whip stitches and then do two rows of stab stitches. And stab stitches is literally just running stitches very close to each other, and we're going to do it two rows down at this edge, and then the same here on the face opening and then fold it in as I said before but with the difference that on the face opening we're going to add a filler thread as well and a filler thread is really just a thread laid on the inside and then it's sewn down by the overcast stitches and then the hood should be done I hope Thank you. 
And then your hood is hopefully done. Mine is at least. And it has been a very, very fun project. I love this kind of project where you don't really have that much stress or press. It is a huge project so you can bring it anywhere and so anywhere and at any time, you know, while watching a movie, for example, without any stress or deadline. So therefore this project has been taking a while. I think you maybe saw how everything slowly turned from summer into winter and now it's December so it has taken a while. And it's also in a small scale but it still contains so much different techniques which has been so fun to try. Everything from the plant dyeing to the sewing to the different stitches, tablet weaving, step stitching and also looking into all these sources as I've done. And right now you're seeing the end result which I recorded on Christmas day and we we were lucky enough to have snow on that day so it was the perfect day for trying out the hood in its right situation because I've really felt like I've been missing that you know from my wardrobe my medieval wardrobe something that keeps me warm when it's cold outside or when it's cold weather harsh wind and so on and I really think this did that thanks to the fabric and also the fact that I lengthened the shoulder part this really kept me warm and that was really my goal to make something that were likely for a uh, working woman to have in the winter in the Middle Ages because as I said we don't really know what they wore but maybe they wore this and after doing this project I really think that might be the solution which was very very interesting to see. I really really hope you like this video and also this little different formula where I had that longer information part in the beginning. It was very very fun to make at least and I hope you thought it was fun to watch too. And if you did, as usual, please let me know. And I also hope that I will see you very, very soon. Bye.